So how many of you guys watch the Super Bowl only for commercials? Are you those kinds of people? Some of you don't want to raise your hand because you're like, well, it's pretty shady commercial. I mean, like 15 of them, you have to like change the channel these days, but there's still some awesome ones. And the most awesome one this last Super Bowl, in my opinion, <laughs> was the miracle stain Joe Montana. Do you guys remember that? You guys, remember, you football fans, you'll remember it. There's these two buddies, and they're sitting on the couch, and they're watching a San Francisco 49ers football game. And the one dude has a tortilla chip and salsa in his hand. And, like, something happens, and he's like, whoa. And the salsa spills on his shirt. And his friend looks over, and he's like, dude. And it's a perfect face of the Hall of Fame quarterback, Joe Montana, who, like, rocked it in the 1980s, you know. But... To a 49ers fan, like he is to you, but like John Elway is for me because I'm a Broncos fan. Absolutely. Okay. It's the off season. I got to get back on track. So there's this Joe Montana stain, right? And they're like freaking out. And then all of a sudden it becomes this national thing where ESPN's into it. And then thousands of people flock to this guy's house to see the Joe Montana stain on the shirt like it's some miraculous thing. And he re-landscapes his yard, and he puts a big sign up and calls it Montana Land. <laughs> and then the commercial ends by he walks into the house, and the framed jersey is gone. And he's like, where is it? And his wife saw a shirt that was stained, and so she washed it. So he's like, oh, Joe, where did you go? But the, my most favorite part of the commercial is when he first sees it. And it's like he sees the stain and instantly looks at his wife, and he's like, Miracle Joe Montana today, and he's like, I don't know, it's just awesome the way he, he does it. And then he travels like the country, like, yeah, my Joe Montana thing. Uh, it's great. Anyways, <laughs> sometimes people try to do that with Jesus, don't they? In that they seek him through some phenomenal thing. It has to be some crazy big thing, or sometimes it's even bizarre, weird, like, uh, that's creepy. I'm going to stay away from that kind of a thing. But if people really wanted to know Jesus, then they'd open up to the gospel of John. John the Apostle, not John the Baptist. John the Apostle wrote the gospel of John. He also wrote four other books of the New Testament. He wrote the letters of 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. And he also wrote the book of Revelation. Five letters in total from this dude. Now, by the time John picked up his pen to write this book, the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, had already been written. These guys had already had their turn in sharing about Jesus. And now, as a finale for the final and fourth gospel, it's John's turn. It's kind of like, after you die, and people are preparing your funeral, and the day comes for your funeral, who are the people that you would like to speak at your funeral, and what kinds of things would you like them to say about you? I mean, it's going to be the one day where a lot of people think about you more than at any other time they've ever thought about you in your life. And that whole day and week, it's just going to be so filled, their minds, about times spent with you. And different people are going to stand up, and they're going to share about your life. Now, each person's going to share different things, some serious, some funny, but usually each person has one specific thing in mind they really want to get across about that person. After Jesus died, four men, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spoke about his life. And each one did have something specific that they wanted to get across about Jesus. Matthew sought to portray Jesus as the king of the Jews. He was appealing to the Jewish people in the audience. 
He quotes from the Old Testament, the Jewish scriptures, more than any other of the gospel writers. Mark seeks to portray Jesus as a servant. And at that time, Rome had all the political power. And in the kingdom of Rome, there were basically two classes of people. There were masters and there were servants. And there were very, very few masters. And the majority of the people were the servants. So it seems like Mark was wanting to really reach out to the common people in that day. It's the shortest of the Gospels. It's not for the educated or the people that have a lot of brain power, but he's just highlighting how Jesus served and helped people. He was a humble servant, and he liked helping people. When it was Luke's turn, he wanted to talk about Christ's perfection, that he was like the ultimate perfect human being. And like I said, at that time, Rome did have all the political power, but the Greeks and their lifestyle still influenced the culture. And so the Greeks were full of philosophers, and they were into the arts and creativity and everything like that. And so Luke seeks to reach that culture. It's the most artistic. It's the most creative of all the Gospels. For example, Luke shares the song of Mary, the mother of Jesus. None of the other gospel writers wrote that. They probably would never have thought of it. But to the Greek mentality, who they were into the arts, a lot of musicians, a lot of poets would have grabbed onto that and been like, well, I want to see what that has to say. Luke records more of Christ's parables than any other of the gospels. You know, the deep, uh, mind-bending philosophical things that Jesus had to say that was very appealing to the Greeks. So these three have given their account. And now, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And so it's John's turn to step up to the podium, and right away, this is what he declares. Now, when's the last time someone wrote a book, and in the opening statement they declare someone to be God himself? Um, let's think about it. Uh, never. <laughs> but that's exactly what Jesus is portrayed as by John here. Right from the beginning, bam, Jesus is God. I mean, like even little kids, when they write letters or cards to their parents, they'll say things like, oh, daddy, I love you. You're the strongest dad, and you can beat all the other kids' dads up in my first grade class. Or like, you're the nicest dad because you play catch with me when you know, you're tired, or mommy, you're the best mommy, I love your food, and you're the prettiest mommy, but no little kid, even though those are their heroes, will open up and say, daddy, you're God. I mean, if he does, the kid's got a messed up dad. <laughs> John is on a mission with his book, and right away he gets to his point. There's no setup story. There's no prefacing. It's Jesus who is the Word, is God. And isn't it interesting how people have a difficult time believing that Jesus is God? There are so many different ideas out there about who Jesus was. They have to acknowledge his existence because it's a historical fact. Non-biblical authors who cared nothing about a Christian agenda, wrote about Jesus of Nazareth and his followers and how they were impacting the world. It's historical proof. It's fact. But believing he's God, woo, wait a second. I mean, even the best of Christians have challenging moments where some of you have questioned and you've wrestled in your mind with the thought, is Jesus really God? Oh, okay, the, I, I, there's someone out there, but 
de- shrunk into a, a human? A Jew 2,000 years ago? Man. And if you at times have found it difficult, how much more did you think his own disciples did? I mean, especially during the beginning portions of his ministry, before he had done uh, most of his miracles and everything. I mean, they lived with him and they saw his humanity. They, thought, they saw that he sweat and he got weak and, and they just saw, you're, you're a human being. They saw him as none of us ever will. I picture the disciples sleeping out under the stars with Jesus in their midst like on a warm summer night right beside the Sea of Galilee. It's like the steady sound of a a lake just in their ear. And I can imagine John at about three in the morning, wake up, can't sleep, and kind of prop himself up on his elbow and just look at this man, sound asleep, not even realizing John was up. And I can just imagine him thinking to himself, is it true? Can this guy be the eternal God? Did this man at one time speak and the universe was created? And am I crazy to think it might be true? At times they were all puzzled at him. They didn't understand him. And they constantly talked amongst themselves about the mystery of his being. Think of the times when they were walking on the road and they're having their own private little conversations and they They were so out of the loop on a lot of things. On top of that, John's personal situation was that he was 18 to 25 years old when he became a disciple of Jesus, and his father Zebedee was a very, very wealthy man. So he is young and rich, which means John has options. You know what I'm saying? John, he's a young dude, He has a lot in front of him, a lot of life choices. He could easily stay and just be like, I'm going to take up dad's business. I'm going to get rich. Easy. But John chose Jesus and left it all for him. I'm going to lay it down, and Jesus, I want to know you perfectly. And sometimes... I'm going to have to give up things in order to do that. And for you guys who are young, if you're in this same age group, whenever you have the opportunity before you to choose a path or choose Jesus, choose the right path. And some of you have. By being here, you are. And there's still that draw, isn't there? There's that draw when you start to compare yourself to other people who are going to like fancy colleges and you have to go to a little college with four letters that stands for all that it is in its name. And they're like at big, they're like at USC or Arizona State or something, and it's like, ah. Oh. And you can compare yourself. Or someone who didn't, didn't even graduate, but now they're like rolling. You see them driving, it's like, dang, that's a nice car. I'm walking <laughs> these days. It's easy to do that, but you know, You choose Christ. Now you think it will always be easy, but when God does bless you with a job or like with money, it becomes more hard than you think. And when when all of a sudden you switch from being that person who always had $25 in the bank account, like the dollar menu is your best friend. It was a smart bit, like McDonald's is like, hey, there's a lot of, like college young adults out there that have like always $25 in their bank account, dollar menu. It's like our best friend at one time. You know the times when if you have over $100 in your bank account, you just think you're rolling like I can do stuff. I can go to a concert. I can do anything, you know. But when you start to see the zeros add up and you're like, you'll be tempted. Just as John might have been tempted. And you need to continue to choose Christ. Because at the end of John's life, there was no regrets, and there will be no regrets for any one of you. When all was said and done, 
when John was near the end of his life, so overwhelmingly convinced by the evidence that he had saw and the things that he had experienced, that when John began to write down his recollections of those amazing three and a half years, he walked with Jesus. He can't think of doing other thing but beginning with declaring the deity of Jesus Christ. This is the one who was in the beginning. He was with God and he was God. The one thing John wanted to get across about Jesus in this gospel is that he is God. Really and truly God. So if you have a problem believing that Jesus is God, the eternal God, then John's going to mess you up because there's 21 chapters. Really, truly God. Another thing about the Gospel of John, and this is super, super fascinating to my mind, it's how different and unique John is from the other three Gospels. It's just so different. Matthew, Mark, and Luke together are what are called the synoptic gospels. They're the synoptic gospels in that they're similar because they share so many of the same stories. You know, not exclusively, but many times Matthew shares about something, Mark talks about it, and Luke talks about it. Yet you get the stories from different perspectives. You know, different details are highlighted, which are sweet. Like you talk to one person, and you hear some things, and you talk to the other guy, it's like, oh, I didn't get that from the other guy. It's like, last summer, Pastor Jared and Eddie Cruz and myself went to Europe, and we went there to visit and encourage the pastors in the churches that we prayerfully and financially support. And the three of us, we all experienced the same thing. It was an awesome trip. But if you talk to Jared, he'll talk to you about individual conversations that he got into and how individual people's lives were impacted. If you talk to Eddie, he'll talk to you about how there was a certain situation and God just seemed to orchestrate the whole thing together where it ended in just this amazing and and perfect result and it just all tied together and it was the hand of God. And then if you talk to me, I'll tell you how the Italians couldn't get Jared's name right and they kept calling him Jerry. (laughs) And by the end of the trip, it was such an awesome thing that that's what we all called him. Like, I just didn't even think about calling him Jared. It was Jerry. It was so sweet that the very last night we were there, it was like the finale of the trip. Uh, We were doing this huge, massive concert outreach of sharing the gospel. And it was like a festival. So there were 10 other bands in the city. So we had this open square in one of the piazzas, and there's thousands of people just there, tons of people walking by. And so it's a pretty sweet thing. And the city wants to know the name of our band. And like, we're from California, so they're going to think we're going to come up with something cool. And our band was called the Jerry Band. (laughs) It's like, how lame, you know, but it was awesome to us. It's like, we're just here to promote Jesus. We're the Jerry Band. So that's a very bad analogy of how different the similarities are of the Synoptic Gospels. (laughs) The Synoptic Gospels primarily focus on Jesus' ministry and the time he spent at the Sea of Galilee, which was way up north. His home base, his home that he chose for himself during those three and a half years with the city of Capernaum, which has amazing ruins. The same synagogue that Jesus preached from. It's right there. It's amazing. And if you are familiar with those Gospels, you'll think, yeah, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Like, it's mostly up in that time around the Sea of Galilee of his ministering and everything like that. But John is different. John focuses on the times he traveled down to Jerusalem and the times that he ministered there. It's very fascinating. If you've read the Gospel of John and and you know it, you just understand, don't you, that it just has a different feel to it. You read the other three, 
And, and then you read John, and right from the beginning, like we saw, it's just, ah, it's just different. And the whole feel, the whole structure of it all, it, it just feels different. To me, the synoptic gospels feel more like I'm reading stories. You know, it's like novels, and I, I just have to, uh, like, follow along someone else's experience. But to me, the feel of John is different. I feel like John is, is like pulling on my shirt, and he's like pulling me near, and he's trying to get me up close and personal with Jesus. It's, it's deep. There's a lot of focus. Also, Matthew, Mark, and Luke record the sayings and the teachings of Jesus. For instance, Matthew shares his sermons. The longest sermon of Jesus is the Sermon on the Mount. The second longest sermon of Jesus, the Olivet Discourse, both in Matthew. Luke shares all of his parables, his sayings, his teachings. But John, John records his conversations. And that's what I love, because there's a big difference. It's like if you've ever really admired a, a president in your lifetime, it's one thing to hear them on TV and and to hear them speak by watching them, or, or even you can YouTube and listen or watch an old speech from them. But what if you could sit down and actually have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with them? How much different, how much more special, how, how awesome would that be? Well, to me, that's the difference in, God's, in, in John's gospel. With the other three gospels, it's like you're walking with all the crowds that followed him up on the on the Galilee side, and, and there's all the hills, and you're like one of the many people in the crowd, and, and you're looking to hear Jesus preach his sermons. But in John, you've ordered your espresso, you've pulled up your chair, and now you're sitting at a table meant for about three or four. John takes us where no one in the crowds could take us. John was not only one of the 12, he was one of the inner circle of three. John shares that conversation Jesus had with Nicodemus, the Pharisee who eventually got saved, but while he was still kind of skittish, he snuck by night to go see Jesus. He didn't want to walk in the day because all of his Pharisee buddies would have given him a lot of grief, but he's curious, he's interested, and that's when Jesus talks to him about being born again, and he talks to him about the Spirit coming in, and, and John was there eavesdropping, listening to this amazing conversation. Or what would Jesus do? What would he be like if he had a one-on-one -on -one situation to try to bring someone to believe in himself? Well, we get that in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, this conversation. John is the only person who records the full conversation between Jesus and Pontius Pilate, the man who decided finally to execute him. And then the book of John ends, the very last chapter, with that amazing and encouraging conversation Jesus had with Peter. After Peter had blown it, he denied he even knew the Lord. And John eavesdrops into this very personal, private conversation and he, he's like hearing Jesus restore this man. It's amazing. He really brings a different perspective than the other three gospel writers. And I think you can really get a feel for what John is like. Like if you were to have a conversation, like if, if he were to even come up here and just like, have a moment to speak with you, I think it would be kind of like this. If you would turn to 1 John, leave the Gospel of John, please turn over to 1 John chapter 1. It's right before Revelation. This is John. This is what he would say. 1 John chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning. So it's a, it's a similar intro as the Gospel of John. He talks about 
Christ in the beginning, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes. We've looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So John, this is, he would say, hey, 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 listen to me. Seriously, I saw him with my own eyes and I can tell you he was rocking a stylish beard (laughs) you know he could say things like I I knew the shape of his hands I knew the exact color of his eyes I heard his voice if I close my eyes and a hundred people speak I could eventually I I would pick out his voice I heard the tones he used when he spoke with people when he raised his voice with the Pharisees and, and when he spoke quietly and lovingly to the sinner, I heard him. I touched him. With my own hands, I touched him. He wasn't a ghost. And if I could describe my own experience with him to you, verse 4, pure joy. And he writes so that your joy could be full. It's a joy that's so full you don't even need to add anything on top of it. It doesn't need something to be mixed to it to enhance it. It's like for me, I love real organic grass-fed cows that can serve me up a nice, fat, juicy T-bone steak. And I lived in the Rocky Mountains. I know the difference. I know a fraud. And I don't pay no $30 from some hormone-fed cow. I like it real, because it is so, right? It's like heaven has dropped in my mouth. It's like a baby angel from heaven just climbed into my taste buds. But I go to Denny's and order a steak? It's like barbecue sauce, hot sauce. Hey, don't be offended if you work at Denny's. The breakfast slams are bomb. Those things are awesome. But I ain't getting no steak from Denny's. (laughs) Spiritually speaking, look at verse 4. These things we write to you that your joy may be Full. It's a full joy. You don't need to add condiments or sprinkle anything else on top of it. Nothing can enhance it. Anything mixed to it takes away from it. And this is what John experienced. And he's saying, I received his joy. And I gave up a life that was tempting me. And now I offer this joy to you. I mean, this is John. You can... You can taste the passion. I mean, he's just like, yeah, the, it's amazing. I saw, I heard, trust me. I mean, he just, right from the beginning of this letter, he, he doesn't like preface anything. He's just like, bam, I saw him. I, I heard him. You need him because he's everything. And without him, whatever you think you have is just an illusion to make you think you have something. Whatever you think about reality is just a dream. And the dream is over when you die and you wake up to your eternal reality. We will live forever. That is real. And Jesus is the only source for us of a connection to something that is actually real pertaining to the afterlife. And John's saying, hey, whatever you think about him, trust me. Trust me. You know, if you have this view of God as some old mean guy in the sky with a frown, 
you have a very false image of God. Yes, he is grieved, and his heart is filled with pain because of all the sin that has caused all the pain in the world. But you can't blame God for all the pain and, and, and think it's him. He gave us a choice. You know what? If you blame God for the pain in the world, then you have to follow that train of thinking and you have to blame Henry Ford for all the accidents people get into on the road today. Is it Henry Ford's fault? Not directly. Indirectly, because he created the car. But it's not his fault. You can't blame God. Sin has caused damage. Sin is painful. Sin always leads to sorrow. And that's the deception of the devil. So even though he's grieved by sin, still, there ain't no one happier than God. He has unparalleled joy and happiness. Nobody can laugh like God. Nobody. Do you know why? Because he has no sin. He has no guilt, no shame, no jealousy, no regrets. God's got nothing to hide, nobody to apologize to. He has no fear of anything. There's just love and holiness and extreme passion. And he gets to show love and receive love, and it's all found within the person of the Trinity. God is the most happy person who has ever or who will ever exist. And John is appealing to us by saying, I was there, man, and it was a trip. I know what he's like. You've got to listen to me. Hey, when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter up from the dead, it was myself, Peter, and John in that room with Jesus. And we saw the color come back into that little girl's skin and we saw her open her eyes. He said, I was there. I was so close to Jesus that I would sit by him anytime we ate together. And after we were done eating, I would lean my head over on his chest. I was there when Jesus showed up and scared the crap out of Thomas. Thomas. <laughs> and yet I saw the brokenness in Thomas and the revelation. I was there looking at the one they call the doubter become a believer, and I saw Thomas' hand reach out and touch the nail piercings in his body. I was there, and I saw, and I even recorded in my gospel, when Thomas looked at Jesus and said, you are my Lord and my God. It's amazing. And so he's saying here, John 1, 1 through 4 of the first epistle, I was there, I saw, I touched him. I was there. I have him. I truly have him. And so can you. As I said before, in John's gospel, he seeks to point out and prove that Jesus is God. So I want to tell you how he goes about doing that real quick. He does it by specifically and strategically mentioning seven miracles that Jesus did. Seven miracles are mentioned in the book of John. He also mentions seven very important statements that Jesus said. Seven miracles and seven statements. These are known as the I am statements of Jesus. And it's interesting because most of this content is found in chapters 1 through 12. In fact, all seven of the miracles and five of the seven statements take place in chapters 1 through 12. And so he's seeking to build a case that Jesus is God in these first 12 chapters. And then as he moves along into chapters 13 through 19, he records the last 24 hours of Jesus' life. 
I mean, no other gospel writer does this. I mean, that's a, a thick dose of what happened in Jesus' last day. And then chapter 20 re- records the resurrection, and chapter 21 is the epilogue. So as a simple outline, if you're taking notes and have a pen handy, and again, this is a simple outline, in chapters 1 through 12, it's about evidence showing Jesus is God. That's his whole thing, evidence to show Jesus is God, so the, we would believe. Chapters 13 through 19 records the day that Jesus died. Chapter 20 is the resurrection. Chapter 21, the epilogue, the the closing. With the statements John uses as he seeks to prove that Jesus is God, they're amazing. They're known as the seven I am statements. And it's fascinating because Jesus calls himself the I am for a reason because that's what the God of the Old Testament called himself. Remember Moses shows up to the burning bush and it's like burning, but yet it's not burning. I see a fire, but the tree is not being burnt up and it's like a really bad acid trip, but then he realized this is God and he takes his sandals off and declares this is holy ground and a voice speaks through the burning bush to him. And at the end of the conversation, Moses says, who are you? And God says, I am that I am. Huh? Well, he doesn't need to explain himself. He is. He always has been. He always will be. He is the self-existent one. He is the I am. And God says, when you go, tell them the I am sent you. And though that's all great and everything, it's kind of like an incomplete sentence. It's like if my wife is sitting on the couch and I said, hey, babe, I am, well, see you later. (laughs) It's like, "Um, okay, you're weird. It's an incompleted phrase, isn't it? I'm sure there were many Old Testament believers who Wanted to know, you are the what, God? You are what? Tell us. Okay, he says, insert Jesus. And seven times in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, I am, and follows it up by something. He says, I am the bread of life. You are to partake of me, to eat my flesh and drink my blood, or else you have no life in you. He says, I am the light of the world. Without me, you will stumble in darkness, and you're blind. He says, I am the door. I am the only way that a person can enter in to eternal goodness in the afterlife. I am the good shepherd that I want to lead you, and if you yield and surrender your life to me and follow me, I have a plan for you. I will lead you. I'm a good shepherd. I will take you into great places for your life. I am the resurrection. With Jesus, there's an absolute guarantee of an eternal existence without tears of sorrow and only bliss in a way we could never imagine. I am the way, the truth, and the life. What is the meaning of life? What is the purpose? We don't know it until we come to know Jesus and knowing Jesus better and more deeply and seeing him more clearly, that is the way. That's life as the creator intended it. And then he says, I am the vine. Boys and girls, you just hold on to me as a branch and you just make sure you're secure with me. Hold on for the ride and I'll get you there. And everything you need will come from the source of the vine and it will come out to your branch and you will have everything you need to where this life is doable until you get to heaven. It's amazing. Jesus shows up and finishes the conversation God started with Moses. And in doing so, he declared to be God. The Pharisees knew it. That's why they tripped out and wanted to stone him. They wanted to kill him. He says, before Abraham was, I am. And in that day, that was 2,000 years ago. So the Pharisees are tripping like, 
Okay, you're alive today. You're not even 50 years old, they said. And before Abraham was, you're the I am. Okay, kill him. <laughs> He's like, stone him. Blasphemer. That's what they did. But he is God. The seven miracles are like this. The first one is that he changes the water into wine. That's the very first miracle Jesus ever did. And we're going to look at that uh, in a couple weeks as we look at chapter 2. His, sec- his second miracle in John is when he healed the nobleman's son. He healed the crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. That's one of the cool stops in the city of Jerusalem to see the twin pools of Bethesda right there. He feeds the 5,000. John also records how Jesus walked on water. He heals a blind man. And the seventh miracle is how he raises Lazarus from the dead. And all seven of these miracles are very crucial and strategic because they all are pointing and making the case that Jesus is indeed the eternal God. And you guys, personally, I, I, I'm so stoked to get into this book. I don't even know what to say. Like, I, just digging into it, personally, like, just, just for me personally and devotionally, God's just been speaking, and I'm looking ahead already to the next sermon. I could probably, if I wanted, I could probably preach to you next week's message. I'm just so, like, I'm ready, Lord. Like, he is going to reveal himself. We're in for an awesome ride, and I really believe God is going to take each one of us, myself included, deeper into Jesus Christ that, than ever before. Isn't that where you want to go? I mean, wherever you've been, we want to go deeper. I, I really, truly believe that for myself. I'm just so pumped to get into this book. One last thing about John and his gospel. One last thing today by way of introduction, is that five times John calls himself the disciple whom Jesus loved. Have you ever caught that? Have you read that before? Even when John talks about himself, he has a way of pointing to Jesus. Make note of that when you share your testimony. Anytime he talked about himself, he made sure to talk about Jesus, and he flipped it around. When you're blessed and life is going great and whatever the blessing is and you start to think, well, it's because of you and it's because of your cleverness and how great you are, hold on. Just remember, it's all about Jesus. It's all about him. The disciple whom Jesus loved. John believed that Jesus loved him. He believed that with all of his heart without hesitation. The things that he writes, he wasn't a guy who struggled with this fact. He knew and comprehended and in a 100% success rate believed Jesus loved him. And the thing that I was especially drawn to about when he uses this statement is that all five times John says this statement, he's saying it in the letter when he's describing the events surrounding the crucifixion and the resurrection. In chapters 1 through 12, he never mentions it. It's like when he's writing John 3 and 4, you know, he's, he's writing all these things. But then John 13 comes, and his mind reflects back to that day. Jesus instituted communion. He was sweating drops of blood in Gethsemane. He was arrested, beaten, And as he gets to that point of the letter, isn't it interesting that that's when he starts to say, Jesus loves me. I'm the disciple whom Jesus loves. And remember, guys, all the other disciples, they flaked, man. They bailed on Jesus. All of them. One of them absolutely betrayed him, was possessed by Satan, and hung himself, Judas. Another one who promised him, even if he had to die with Jesus, he wouldn't betray him. Peter denied him three times a couple hours later. And all the other ones just took off, probably hiding in some closet somewhere, sucking their thumb because they don't want what's happening to Jesus to happen to them. 
But there was one, only one of them, that stuck around through the whole process. And as close as they all were to him, John is the only person who could look somebody in the eye and say, you know what? I was there. I heard with my own ears the moaning, terrifying kind of sound I'd never heard it come out of his mouth. I, I heard it. I heard what come out of him when they pierced his hands and feet. I heard it. Only John could say, I, I saw him hang in there. I, I can tell you I remember the drops of blood and the puddle of blood before the cross. I was there, he would say, crying, weeping, confused, afraid to look, afraid to think, wondering why. Wanting to just scream, Jesus, dude, come on. Do something. I mean, I heard these guys mocking him, spitting loogies on him, trashing him. I saw it all, and I wondered why he didn't just take his finger and just squish him like a bug. Just like make their bodies explode or something. I was frustrated. I... I held his mama for hours and we sat together at the foot of the cross weeping and weeping. I heard her cries. Only John can say that. But John is the only one who could also say, I was also there when he changed the game. I was also there when the momentum swung. Because to my surprise, in the corner of my eye, I saw him all of a sudden just push down on the nail and, and gasp for air and just scream at the top of his lungs, it is finished. I heard that. And when I looked up, I saw a man who knew he was about to die but not in defeat. I saw his demeanor change. I saw a beaten, bloodied, wounded warrior who had done everything that it looked like he was going to lose, but in his eyes, he looked like he was about to win. Can you imagine? I saw, I saw the expression in his face when he looked up and breathed his last breath, and it was a look of absolute victory and triumph. And then I saw his body at once collapse. And I knew he was gone. I saw, to my surprise, Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea, two wealthy, wealthy, highly respected Jewish men, lose their careers, their jobs, lose all their status, when they decided to stop being like the phony Pharisees and they came and those two men in their wealthy pharisaical robes wrenched the nails out of his hands and took his body down. And finally they dropped their religious pride and they let his blood wet and stain their rich religious robes. So yes, yes, it was easier for John to say than any other person, I understand the reality of Jesus' love. Yeah? Yes? Amen? So through John, as we get into this gospel, this is the perspective we get. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? This man who wants so intently to bring us into a deeper relationship 
with Christ than we've ever had before, who wants to bring us into the private, personal life of Jesus and say, hey, pull up a chair. Listen. And through the lens of John, we get to see Jesus in a way that we never could. And we see that, yes, he is the one who loves sinners. He is the one who heals and serves and waits patiently on people when he'd rather do something else. He's the one who talks to strangers and gives them their time, even though he's got a busy schedule. And he dies to take upon his enemy's punishment. But he is the one who rises again. So my prayer, as we get rolling through this thing, that we would really, really come to a place as we see Jesus revealed through John's spirit-led testimony that you too would fully and confidently be able to say, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. I am. I am. It's one thing for me to tell you Jesus loves you, but you have to say that confidently to yourself. And sometimes that's a hard thing, isn't it? Isn't it weird how immediately some of you start thinking of that and there's mental blockades and feelings of guilt and could he love me? And sometimes you think I can't approach him as boldly as I think I could and I want to believe he loves me, but sometimes that's just not there. And God wants to bring you a place where you get a grip to where your heart can be opened up to really understand he loves you in spite of you. Not because of you. In spite of the poison and the junk and whatever, he loves you. He's crazy about you. He's ridiculously passionate about you. What heroic love story have you seen where a man willingly dies on a cross for his bride? You might see a bullet hole or something, but whoa, does it have to be that graphic? Well, I just want to make sure you understand my love for you. I want you guys to be able to say, because this is God's heart, to say Jesus loves me, and you really mean it when you confess it. It's not about what you can do for God. It's not about your love for him. The focus is always him. It's always his love. It's always about what he's done, who he is, his love for you. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the greatness, the reality, Jesus, of who you are, the awesome and eternal one. And Lord, I pray for every believer in this house today that they would really be able to comprehend the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of your love for them, that it's deeper than the ocean, higher than the heavens. Your love is beyond that for each personal human soul who sits here this morning. Lord, help us to come to a place where we can truly say, I am the disciple whom Jesus loves. Father, would you fill our hearts with that knowledge, with that truth? In Jesus' name we pray, amen.